Hello, I'm Andy Agathangelo. I'm carrying out this video interview of Martin Woods in my capacity as chair of the Secretariat Committee to the All Party Parliamentary Group on Personal Banking and Fairer Financial Services. I am also, however, the founder of the Transparency Task Force, which provides the Secretariat to the All Party Parliamentary Group. Martin, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to have this conversation with me. As you know, the conversation is being video recorded. Uh, the video recording will be placed on the APPG's website and will raise awareness of it through the social media and so on. Uh, you're carrying out this conversation with me, Martin, on the basis that you have already provided a written submission to the APPG's call for evidence about the Financial Conduct Authority. So uh, could I invite you, please, Martin, first of all, just to Tell us a little bit about yourself and outline just briefly to begin with how you came to interact with the Financial Conduct Authority. Thank you. Andy, thank you. And thank you for the committee for giving me this opportunity to talk and present my evidence in my case and my interaction with the FCA. So I'm a 57 year old father of three. I was initially in my early part of my career, a police officer in the Metropolitan Police and the National Crime Squad for 18 years the last five of which I specialised in the investigation of money laundering. On leaving the police service in 2001, I went to work for um, banks as an anti-financial crime, anti-money laundering expert. And there came a time in about 2005, I joined Wachovia Bank, which is now part of the Wells Fargo Banking Group. And I blew the whistle about the bank's money laundering activities to the FCA, initially in regard to Mexican drug trafficking and the laundering of the proceeds of Mexican drug trafficking, and subsequently the laundering of um, billions of dollars from Russian organised crime and from Russian um, accounts via Latvia. Thank you. Uh, what role were you in and what firm were you working for when you blew the whistle? I was the money laundering reporting officer approved by the FCA for Wachovia Bank. Thank you. Uh, did you follow your employer's whistleblower policy? Uh, can you provide us with a copy of your employer's whistleblower policy? Uh, how did this whistleblower policy tell you to blow the whistle? Uh, did it tell you what you must include so that your disclosure was protected? Okay, there's a little bit of uniqueness about being a money laundering reporting officer. I file suspicious activity reports to the authorities, um, all of which qualify as disclosures under the Public Interest Disclosure Act and under relevant employment law. So I was making these disclosures, hundreds of them, in regard to the bank's clients and activity within the bank, and even senior manager in the bank, who I accused of helping the Mexicans to launder their money. So I was doing that from the money laundering perspective. I was not making an internal whistleblowing report. I do not have a copy of the policy. And eventually, I was advised um, after the bank attacked me and, and initiated discipline proceedings against me for doing the job I did, I was advised by a lawyer to blow the whistle directly to the FCA, which I, the FSA as it was at the time, which I did. Thank you. Martin. Thank you Martin. Uh, when did you blow the whistle to the FSA? Um, uh, what age were you then? I was 44 and it was August 2008. Thank you. Have you ever witnessed any actions or conduct that, in your reasonable belief, breached any law, regulatory code or applicable relevance policy? And if so, uh, please explain which law code or policy you believe was breached. Yes, I believe the bank was laundering money contrary to the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. Specifically, a senior manager in the bank tipped off um, a group of money launderers and advised them to not continue sending checks to London. Essentially, I think he said he could manage the business in America but couldn't control me in London and therefore they had to find other, other routes to he would say process that money, I would say launder that money. And then the second piece would be um, mistreatment of a whistleblower contrary to section 18.1 of the FCA's handbook, CISC 18.1 of the FCA's handbook. I was given some of the classic treatment that uh, whistleblowers um, receive, including um, an office without a window, believe it or not. They still exist and, and they still put people in those offices with the isolation. I was disciplined for doing my job. Um, I was isolated, ostracised. Um, and then latterly, um, the FCA um, were guilty of deception and making false allegations against me, fabricating allegations against me. 
Um, they invented a non-existent whistleblower, uh, all with a view to stop me from ever becoming uh, an FCA approved money laundering reporting officer ever again. The, the points that you just raised, Martin, are so serious. I'm going to invite you to repeat them just to make sure nobody's uh, under any uh, misapprehensions about what you just said. Would you mind repeating the last couple of points that you made to me? The last couple of points about the FCA. So the FCA fabricated, senior manager of the FCA fabricated allegations against me, um, invented a non-existent whistleblower to hide behind and put those allegations upon a whistleblowing document which rendered me as a non, um, not a normal application if I ever again saw, and this was in their own wording, lest he ever again seeks to be an approved person, this should challenge his fit and properness. The irony of it is, the false allegations they were making against me, they were challenging my integrity. I'm the whistleblower telling the truth, and these people were challenging my integrity. It was, um, my counsel advised me on this, and he said it was a, a classic piece of vengeance by the FCA. Thank you, Martin. On to question number six. Uh, what was the nature of the misconduct, infringement, malpractice, or so on that you alleged? Well, in, as I say, with the FCA, with senior managers at the FSA, as it was at that time, embarked upon a course of action to prevent me from being approved as a money laundering reporting officer at any time in the future. The managers determined I would like to make negative comments about the FCA's whistleblowing department and took revenge upon me before I'd even um, attended this event. I was attending and presenting at an event in Miami where I was going to tell my story about money laundering at Wachovia Bank and whistleblowing, but this document said I would not breach my non-disclosure agreement. That clearly was stated in the document they referred to. Subsequently, when this matter was investigated by the FCA, they concluded it was, um, it, it was right to record intelligence when there was a risk someone would say something negative about a function of the FCA. They said it was a, um, it showed a lack of care on their part and it was a relative, relatively minor failing. They didn't accept that the, the challenge the integrity. What I would say, and it's not in my initial report, is I was struck by the Gloucester report uh, into London Capital Finance, within which Andrew Bailey's office had asked um, Dame Elizabeth Gloucester to find no managers at the FCA responsible or accountable. And I think that chimes with what happened with this investigation with me. It was a clear-cut case. The evidence was sat in front of the FCA to show what had happened. There was nothing to contradict it, but they followed a line that is in accordance with Andrew Bailey's wish that no FCA managers are found responsible or accountable for anything. Thank you, Martin. On to question number seven. Uh, what interaction have you had with the FCA about the situation? Lots and mainly bad. I was interviewed by them in August, September 2008. And after that, they blanked me, were very dismissive. Um, I wanted to make, submit a further whistleblower report. They initially said they didn't need to speak to me. I submitted it anyway. It was all about Russian money laundering. I even referenced Sampo Bank in Estonia, which subsequently come Danske Bank's branch in Estonia laundered hundreds of billions. Um, they call that my that report my latest missive. I think what I actually meant was dismissive because they did absolutely nothing about it. Um, my experience with the FCA has constantly been negative. Um, it's an organisation self-obsessed protecting its own reputation and it's wholly unaccountable. Martin, on to question number eight. Um, did the FCA explain or define the extent of their regulatory authority to you in respect of the matters you were raising? Yes, which is to say the FCA asserted confidentiality obligations to member firms within FISNA, FISMA, the Financial Services and Markets Act, which they assert and take primacy over feedback to whistleblowers. Thank you. And number nine, uh, what evidence, if any, did he give the FSA, FCA um, and or any other entity? Two substantial and detailed whistleblowing reports, which I will give to the um, to the committee, as well as copies of emails and internal bank reports completed by me about money laundering, um, Russian money laundering through Latvia. Thank you, Martin. Uh, for convenience, if you could please include the documentation you're happy to provide and put into the public domain into your submission, we'll also um, put that uh, onto the APPG's website, as long as you're happy for it to go into the public domain. I am. There was one little situation with that. When I received lots of this documentation, I don't know if you've come across other whistleblowers or other people who interact with the FCA, I was threatened with 
um, arrest and charge if I did put any of this into the public domain. But subsequently, the Times newspaper in 2016 ran a story about the FCA blacklisting me, pursuant to which Andrew Bailey contacted CEO of Protect, Kathy James, and said you should put everything, everything in the public domain so that the public can see it. So Andrew Bailey's given me permission to put it all in the public domain, which I'm grateful for. Thank you for uh, making us aware of that. Thank you very much. On to question number 10. Uh, what, if anything, do you believe the FCA could have done that may have prevented the matter that you blew the whistle on from happening in the first place? Well, I, I, I remember writing this, from where do I start? But what I would say is the FCA has proved itself to be incapable of applying the criminal law within a regular regulated sector namely the Proceeds of Crime Act. The FCA has walked priorities which always place a firm, their member firms, ahead of the public and the whistleblower. I don't believe they adequately understand money laundering and its connections to serious and organised crime. There were times when Wachovia Bank was treated as a victim of my whistleblowing. Number 11, uh, to your knowledge, uh, what did the FCA do to investigate the matter that you raised? I did learn from third parties. They undertook an early morning visit to the bank before doing so, they called the CEO the night before, or the evening before, to alert him that tomorrow morning, pursuant to criminal allegations, they were going to undertake a dawn raid. Um, having initially told him this, I, I, I learned that he panicked and was most unhappy that he was the only one who could know, and he was given permission to, to inform general counsel. Um, thus, the FCA, when investigating criminal allegations and money dawning, called the suspect and advised them of their intended actions before then undertaking a surprise well, of some nature dawn raid. So notwithstanding a number of requests, the FCA never updated me to the actions they took in regards to my initial whistleblowing report. They were totally dismissive of my second whistleblowing report and um, they never appeared to me to do anything about my complaint that senior people at uh, Wachovia Bank were guilty of mistreating a whistleblower contrary to the rules in their own handbook. I do sense I think it was an inconvenience to the FCA, FSA as it was. Thank you. And in your written testimony, uh, Martin, you make reference to uh, Euro-Russian money laundering. Um, given what's happening in Ukraine right now, it may be appropriate, if you don't mind, just to elaborate on the, the Russian dimension to what you believe was taking place. Yeah, I mean, Wachovia Bank, as an American bank, was late to the international marketplace. It was not a well-known bank, it was not a primary US dollar clearer. So in Mexico, they were um, providing the services to smaller banks and money service businesses because other banks had exited that business. It's as though Wachovia was at the bottom of the barrel. And a friend of mine once said, he said, yeah, but they took a drill out, drilled through the bottom of the barrel and pulled stuff in that wasn't even at the bottom of the barrel. That's the nature of their business. Um, in this instance, the second part materialized because the Regulation in America complained to the bank. They saw a one-way flow of intelligence from London to America about all the, whistle, all the money laundering I was seeing with the Mexicans. And they saw nothing going back the other way. So the, the bank began to draw me into US dollar clearing um, inquiries that they were undertaking with correspondent banks, particularly in Eastern Europe, Russia, Latvia. And on that, I saw lots of UK limited liability, limited liability partnerships and New Zealand companies. And I just saw money laundering, lots and lots of money laundering. And the bank was asking ridiculously stupid questions and accepting equally ridiculously stupid answers. So people have looked at this and taken my initial whistleblower report in that sense and gone on. Friends of mine at the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project have published lots of laundromat investigations. And um, one of the directors who's a good friend of mine, Paul Radu, he says, he should be only followed you, your work. You did the first laundromat investigation the first Russian money laundering investigation that we followed. And that was the use of these UK LLPs with offshore um, partners. It's a model that has existed for years because the way in which companies' house is set up, it's very friendly to money launderers. Thank you, Martin. Uh, to what extent did the FCA act promptly and effectively to investigate your allegations? I, I don't know, because they would never tell me. Number 13. Uh, thereafter, as far as you know, what did the FCA do to prevent the alleged misconduct from continuing? Nothing, because banks continue to break the rules on laundering money. <laughs> I mean, money laundering, there's two businesses, two parallel businesses operate in London. One's called anti-money laundering. Banks spend an awful lot of money in that space. 
and you want to call money laundering, and perhaps banks make a lot of money in that space. There's two parallel industries. Number 14, in your opinion, to what extent did the FCA act promptly and effectively to prevent the alleged misconduct from continuing? Nothing regarding the money laundering, the mistreatment of me as a whistleblower and the dishonest conduct of their colleagues, nothing at all. Number 15, if you suffered detriment or loss of job, uh, what was the impact on your personal income in each of the three years after you blew the whistle compared to your income in the three years prior to your dismissal? Okay, I've never, I, I blew the whistle in 2008, I've never returned to that level of remuneration. I was before I blew the whistle, I never got back to that level. I've applied for multiple roles, constantly unsuccessful. I recall one instance, it's not in my initial submission, but I think it's right to mention it here. I was going for a job with Royal Bank of Scotland to be cover, maternity cover for the money laundering reporting officer's job. And one of the people interviewing me said to me, we would want you to do exactly the same here at this bank as what you did at Wachovia Bank. It was very, very warm, very good interview. Um, the bank, I think, were almost close to drawing up the contract. And then subsequently, I didn't get the job. And I think that's because I would the, the bank would have contacted the FCA and said, we're looking to appoint Martin Woods. And they would learn that I was a non-routine. I'd, I'd been blacklisted. I had this black mark against me that I was unaware of, this fake whistleblowing report that stopped me getting those jobs. So to some extent, those people at the FCA were successful in stopping me getting jobs that I should have got. Imagine, if you will, I could have been a money laundering point officer from that West Bank, and I would have stopped all that money laundering with that um, business in, in um, Yorkshire, the, the jewellery business. It wouldn't have happened on my watch. Martin, thank you very much for explaining that. Um, in your opinion, how well or badly has the FCA treated you as a whistleblower? Um, how well has it protected your privacy, ensured that your career was not adversely affected and helped to safeguard your mental health? On the contrary, the FSA, FSA as it was, the FCA as it is, undertook action to harm me. They, stopped, they sought to stop me ever again receiving FCA approval for a role in financial services. And to some extent, they were successful. All of this had a prolonged adverse impact upon my mental health. Think about it. I did the right thing and blow a whistle to the FCA about serious crimes taking place, and they stabbed me in the back to make me make sure I don't do it again. They almost destroyed my belief system. Number 17, Martin. <laughs> If you have suffered financially or otherwise as a result of blowing the whistle, how effective has the FCA been in securing redress for you from the guilty parties? On the contrary, I suffered because I could not secure the new roles because the FCA, FSA stopped me. And Brayton, how effective has the FCA been in securing redress from the victims of the alleged misconduct in prosecuting or banning the perpetrators so they are unable to continue doing it. Again, it was as though the bank was the victim of my whistleblowing. They sought to ban me, not the bad actors. No, you know, I blew the whistle upon a senior manager who tipped off and helped out the Mexican drug money launderers. He went on to a bigger job at a bigger bank. What do you believe the FCA could have done better in relation to your whistleblowing case? Quite simply, acted with integrity. Number 20. In general terms, what would you say about the FCA's effectiveness and timeliness in responding to your whistleblower situation? It was one of the most appalling situations I've ever encountered. Not for one moment did I believe a regulator could act in the way they did, and they've got away with it. 21. What are your thoughts on whether the FCA lacks the powers that it needs, or conversely, that it doesn't make good use of the powers that it already has? It makes wrong use of its powers. It is. It is a belief of unaccountability which causes and allows them to behave badly, knowing they can get away with it. I would also say, as a regulator, they should not be in charge of applying the criminal law. They don't understand the difference between regulations and the criminal law. They don't understand the seriousness of money laundering for organised crime groups. And, and therefore, they don't, in my view, adequately and properly protect whistleblowers. I will say this now, it's important that it becomes to this committee and I'll get the documentation around it. I helped their whistleblower last year who blew the whistle to the FCA and others about issues with a bank. He'd done it before. He ended up working with a very, very, very big bank in London. And it's for conduct and culture within the bank, pursuant to a regulatory instruction from the US. His boss was a former FCA supervisor. 
His boss said to him at a certain point in time, I know what you did at your last bank. I knew all whistleblowers. I read all whistleblower reports. I know who you are. Don't do it here. Think for a moment. We are talking about people blowing the whistle about serious organized crime. A man leaves the FCA and has in his head the names of all whistleblowers and tells people that. The same man said, you stop being a whistleblower when you go public and you have no protections. Clearly has no understanding whatsoever. But the danger of that, the danger that there's an individual out there, and we don't know if it's one person or there's several FCA supervisors. We don't know how the FCA protects whistleblowers' identity and the information they provide, but I don't believe they act properly. They don't understand what they're doing. Martin, I'm also, in, in the event that the APPG would like more detail about what you've just explained, would you be happy to provide it to the APPG? I, I can get that. I, I have a duty to get that. I know, I know you know, obviously, this book inside, I have an absolute duty to get that. I am aware that the um, Information Commission's Office has been informed of this breach by, by the whistleblower, and I believe there's an ongoing investigation by the Information Commission's Office into the FCA about that particular issue. Thank you. Question number 22. In general terms, how would you describe what it's been like dealing with the FCA? One word, appalling. 23. What is your perception of the culture of the FCA and what do you think about it? It's an unaccountable body obsessed with protecting its own, own reputation. There is a culture of arrogance. You cannot accuse the FCA, FSA of wrongdoing. There's intimidation within the industry, which inhibits people calling out FCA failings. 24. Have you ever complained officially about the FCA? If so, to whom? Um, please tell us what happened and how you feel about what happened. Uh, what feedback, if any, have you had about your complaint? How helpful was the feedback? How long has it taken for your complaint to be processed? It took a long time. I did complain to the FCA for the conduct of their managers in fabricating these allegations against me. Um, it was a whitewash which ignored the inconvenient facts that were sat right in front of them and clearly showed I had not, would not, and did not breach my non-disclosure agreement. There was no question of my integrity whatsoever. Um, having failed because they described it as a lack of care and a relatively minor failing, um, I went to the Ombudsman and he too ignored the facts in order to protect the false narrative and distorted position adopted by the FCA. I complained, CNU managers have propagated these allegations against me, invented this non existent whistleblower and submitted this false whistleblower report challenged my integrity. The FCA described the actions as relatively minor failing. Thus, the FCA carried out, carried on supporting the FSA and the managers who did this. There is a lack of integrity and the financial service industry suffers because of that. If people can behave in that way and they're supposed to be supervising this, they can attack a whistleblower and, and seek to undermine his integrity and seek to stop him inconveniently blowing a whistle about criminal conduct in banks in the future. Where are we heading? Martin, so just with the intention of clarifying the point, you've made reference a couple of times to uh, uh, the FCA creating or inventing a non-existent whistleblower. Could you please just tell us a bit more about that, just so we would understand what you're saying? So I have a series of emails that initiate, initially somebody from, somebody sent a promotional document, a copy of a promotional document I was going to be presenting at a financial crime event in Miami later that year. This document said I would not breach my non-disclosure agreement. I would be talking in generic terms about what you could do to find criminal conduct within your bank. So that should be a positive for the regulator. What the FCA had issues about and concerns about was that I would say some, something negative about their whistleblowing process. Well, subsequently, when, when the global financial crisis happened, you know, we all know what happened then. The FCA was quite rightly criticized for a number of failings, including whistleblowing. Therefore, these individuals who were seeking to hurt me couldn't put their own name to this because they knew the allegations were false. So they invented a, a fake whistleblower and they created a false whistleblowing document. I have the emails that showed up the chain of how that happened and I have a copy of the fake whistleblowing document, which was all provided to me under the, the um, a data subject to <laughs> request from the data, Protect data Protection Act. So I have all the documents to show it. Um, it was it, it, it shook me and shocked me um, that they could do this. It was just appalling. 
Question number 25, Martin. Uh, overall, uh, what have been the consequences to you and your, if relevant to your family, as a result of what's happened? They've been good, they've been positive, because I made it that way. You, you spoke to me before. I earn less money, but I return my integrity and my credibility, and they are priceless. I'm proud of what I did. I would do it again, but few financial firm, service firms will allow me to do so. It's very difficult. The, the irony is in, in banking, right? The financial service industry, they don't trust the honest man. 26. Um, what would your advice be to somebody thinking about blowing the whistle to the FCA on a matter to do with misconduct in the financial services sector? Manage your expectations. I have, I have advised some people report matters to the FCA and others not to do so. Credits to the FCA, some of them have, have people I spoke to have, have sent some feedback say, and they've said, please thank him for telling you to come to us. What I would say to that then is I don't think that everybody who works for the FCA is a bad person. That's ridiculous. I just think they have a very bad culture and conduct and their senior managers are not good at what they do. 27. Um, if you could change three things about the FCA, what would they be? The CEO, the culture and the accountability. 28. Uh, what positives are there about the FCA that you'd like to comment on? As I said, there are some good people who work there. 29. What do you think about the possibility of conflict of interest issues at the FCA? There are far too many and they are not appropriately managed. But what are the interests of the FCA? A sense of primary interest is their own reputation. Secondly, it's protection of big firms who pay big fees. And the public rank a long way down the priority list and below them are whistleblowers. Number 30, do you believe there should be spot checks by the FCA on regulated and or unregulated entities, perhaps similar to the spot checks by VAT inspectors? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure I see what this, this, this would achieve, random spot checks by who and for what reason. Um, and then if you look above, when they've done this before, they had the allegation of crime and they phoned the CEO the, the day before, say we're coming to see you tomorrow. They're not capable of doing these spot checks. Also, the, the FCA don't want to ask questions that they can't manage the answer to. When you blow the whistle upon a big bank for laundering money, you're simultaneously blowing the whistle on failed supervision because they allowed it to happen. And they don't, so they don't like being told or getting things wrong. They don't like finding things that are wrong. In the Gloss report, when Bailey said, don't find any of my senior managers accountable or responsible, it was ridiculous. Number 31, the FCA is undertaking a transformation project. Do you have any comments to make about that? Yeah, this is an opportunity for change. A transformation project proposes the status quo is not working. We're agreed upon that. Thus, what next? What is the purpose of the FCA? What do the public want and expect? What do members, firms, in particular big banks want? Who is a priority? The big change needs to be accountability. The FCA needs to be judged, measured, assessed, and when necessary, criticised. The FCA needs to be, be responsive to change. 32, and this is the final question, Martin. Are there any other comments that you would like to make? No, I, I welcome the endeavour and I wish you well but I, I will also manage my expectations of the FCA and, and this, this um, review and, and their uh, intention to change. There are some powerful groups like it the way it is, albeit they are wrong. Martin Woods, thank you very much indeed for providing your uh, video testimony to me today, but also for providing the original written submission you provided and you're going to be adding to it the documentation that you referred to during uh, today's session. Uh, thank you also for agreeing if the APPG were to ask you for clarification on any of these points to be willing to, uh, to, to liaise accordingly. Marty Woods, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.